Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 289 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about where the tomb of Christ is located. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Jesus of Nazareth, regarded by Christians as God's Messiah or Christ, is the most pivotal figure in world history. The New Testament records that he was crucified, died, and was buried before rising from, the, from death three days later. If this is true, he must have been buried in a particular location. But where is it? There have been various claims. There are different sites honored by Christians and members of other groups. And some skeptical scholars doubt that Jesus was buried in a tomb at all. So what does the historical evidence say? Which possibilities are good candidates and which are bad ones? And can we identify the most likely place that Jesus was buried? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, how do you want to start today's mystery? By taking a look at what the four canonical Gospels have to say about where the tomb of Christ was located, the four Gospels are our earliest sources on the subject, so we need to take a look at them first. Scholars differ on when the four Gospels were written. A common view is that they were written between A.D. 70 and A.D. 90 or 100, so beginning about 40 years after the crucifixion and spanning a 20 to 30 year period. However, as we discussed in episode 140 on when the Gospels were written, I believe that a careful and unbiased look at the evidence reveals that they were written somewhat earlier than that. I date the earliest gospel, Mark, to about A.D. 55, and the last gospel, John, to about A.D. 65. I also think Luke can be dated to around A.D. 59, and that Matthew can be dated to around A.D. 63. So I think that the gospels were written beginning about 20 years after the crucifixion and spanning a decade. You can go back and listen to episode 140 to hear why. With that as background, let's look at what the four Gospels say about where Jesus was buried. Beginning with the first Gospel to be written, Mark, we read this about what happened to Jesus after he was condemned to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. So after he was condemned to death in the governor's palace or headquarters, they led him out to crucify him. The text does not specify what they led him out of. They certainly led him out of the governor's palace, but they also may have led him out of the city. The latter option is preferable for several reasons. First, Mark says that at the time he was impressed into service, Siren of Cyrene was coming in from the country. That suggests that they met him as he was coming toward or into the city, which suggests that they were taking Jesus outside the city for crucifixion. Second, the author of Hebrews states, We have an altar from which those who serve in the tabernacle do not have the right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sins are burned up outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate, in order that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. So we must go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. This passage is at least a little ambiguous. When the author says that we must go outside the camp to Jesus, he's speaking metaphorically. 
he means that his Jewish readers must go outside of mainstream Judaism to be with Jesus. So the author might be speaking metaphorically in the previous statement where he says that Jesus suffered outside the gate. However, that second statement is connected to an earlier one about how the bodies of sacrificed animals were burned outside the camp of the Israelites, and that's not a metaphor. For example, Exodus 29.14 says this of the bulls used in sin offerings to consecrate Israelite priests. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. So the bodies of sacrificed animals really were burned outside the camp, and the author of Hebrews says, therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. The author of Hebrews thinks that Jesus was literally sacrificed outside the camp or the city, just as the bodies of the animals were burned outside, and his Jewish readers must metaphorically go outside the camp or mainstream Judaism to find Christ. A skeptic could say that maybe the author of Hebrews is here making a theological inference. That is, since he knew the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp, he only infers that Jesus was crucified outside. But this seems unlikely because we've already seen evidence from Mark, and it's evidence repeated in other Gospels, that suggests Jesus was taken outside of the city to be crucified. And thirdly, and finally, the scholars generally agree that the crucifixion of Jesus would have taken place outside of the city just based on Roman crucifixion pra practices. So we have good reason to think that Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem and that Golgotha was a site that was outside of the city, a fact whose significance will become apparent as we start evaluating the theories about where Christ's tomb is. Mark then continues and says this, And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate, and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. And he bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. So Mark records that after the crucifixion, a man named Joseph of Arimathea intervened. He says Joseph was a respected member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, and that he took courage and asked Pontius Pilate for the body, and that after verifying that Jesus was dead, Pilate granted him the body. Joseph then bought a linen shroud and wrapped Jesus in it. He put him in a tomb. Uh, the tomb had been cut out of a rock face and he rolled a stone against its door. Now, here's the parallel text from the Gospel of Luke that I estimate was the next to be written. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their purpose and deed, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever yet been laid. Luke adds a few details that Mark doesn't mention. Luke adds that Joseph, despite the fact he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, had not consented to the council's decision to turn Jesus over for execution. Luke also adds that Joseph put Jesus in a new tomb, one that nobody had ever been placed in before. However, since it takes time to cut a tomb out of rock face, this tomb must have been recently prepared for somebody else, and who was still alive and thus didn't need to use it yet, so nobody had been laid in it yet. In Matthew's parallel passage, we read, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb 
and departed. Matthew adds that Joseph was a rich man, which would not be unexpected for a member of the Jewish ruling council. He also mentions that Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. This goes beyond what Mark and Luke have previously mentioned. Mark says that he was a respected member of the council. Uh, Luke says that he had not consented to the council's decision. Luke also says that he was righteous. But none of those things prove that he was a Christian. However, both Mark and Luke say that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. Taken literally, that could just mean that he had an interest in corporate eschatology or the coming of the end times, or even that he was expecting the end times to arrive soon. But since John the Baptist and Jesus both announced the coming of God's kingdom, which reached a new level of fulfillment in the creation of the church, the phrase, was looking for the kingdom of God, suggests that Joseph was a Christian. After all, we're talking about a man that Mark and Luke say was respected, righteous, was looking for the kingdom, and did not consent to Jesus' death. Putting all that together, it strongly suggests that he was a Christian, and Matthew thus says flat out that he was a disciple of Jesus. Matthew also says that Joseph put Jesus' body in his own new tomb. So Joseph owned the tomb, and that would be consistent with what we heard in Luke, that nobody had ever been laid in it. We already saw that the tomb was newly cut for a person who was still living, and Matthew reveals that this person was Joseph of Arimathea, which would make sense of why Joseph was able to put Jesus in his tomb, in this tomb, without needing to ask for or get permission from a different owner, because he owned it. Finally, there's the passage that's parallel to this in John. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. John confirms Matthew's statement that Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but he adds that he was secretly a disciple. He kept it on the down low because he was afraid of repercussions. The same was true of Nicodemus, who John introduced to us earlier in the gospel, and he says that both Joseph and Nicodemus prepared Jesus' body for burial in keeping with Jewish custom. John also says, like Luke, that the tomb was a new one that had not been used before, and he says that it was located in a garden in approximately the same place that Jesus was crucified. So that's why the location of Golgotha was important. So Golgotha was in or near the garden where Joseph's tomb was located. Now, preparing a body for burial counts as work in Judaism, and you can't work on the Sabbath. But all this was happening on a Friday afternoon, on the Jewish day of preparation for the Sabbath, so Joseph and Nicodemus didn't have long before the Sabbath began at sunset, and they couldn't work anymore. And John says that's why they used the tomb in the garden, which Matthew says was Joseph's own tomb. If they'd had more time, since then, you know, since according to Matthew, Joseph was a rich man, he could have hypothetically arranged to buy a tomb from someone else, but that would have taken time and they were very short on time. So Joseph said, in effect, let's just use my own tomb, which is right here in this neighboring garden. Given Jewish burial customs, what would have been expected to happen next? Would they just leave the body of Jesus alone until someone else in Joseph's family died and needed to be buried? Actually, it's more complex than that. That's what we do today if someone has a family mausoleum or an above-ground tomb. Um, people get buried when they die, and then nothing really happens until another family member dies and needs to be put in the mausoleum. But that's not what a lot of Jewish people did in first century Palestine. Instead, they practice a kind of two-stage form of burial. 
In the first stage, they would bury the person immediately, typically on the same day as death, because unlike the Egyptians, the Israelites did not practice embalming. Uh, We discussed Egyptian burial customs back in episode 241 on mummies, and the Egyptians had a 70-day burial process that involved mummifying or drying out the body so it wouldn't decompose. But the Israelites didn't do that, except for the patriarchs Jacob and Joseph, who died in Egypt and were mummified as a sign of respect. When later Israelites, back in the Promised Land, buried a body, it would still be moist and it would decompose, leaving only the bones. That's the reason for the two-stage form of burial they used. After the initial burial, Jews in Palestine would wait about a year, and then, after the body had decomposed, they would come back. They would take the bones and clean them, and then, for the second stage of the burial, they would be put in a permanent storage place, either on a ledge or a niche in a tomb, or in a special box for bones, a kind of box known as an ossuary that would itself be placed in a tomb. So that's what Joseph of Arimathea was apparently planning on doing now that Jesus was dead. He's completed the first stage burial, and he expected to come back in a year and clean the bones. Uh, Perhaps he would then give them to Jesus' family for the second stage of burial, which would happen either in Nazareth or in Bethlehem, since Jesus had family in both places, and there might be a family tomb in either place. But this expectation was short-circuited when Jesus rose from the dead on the third day and the tomb was found empty. So let's summarize. Taking what the four Gospels say together, what do they indicate about the tomb of Jesus and its location? Taken together, the four Gospels indicate that the tomb was owned by Joseph of Arimathea, that it was a new tomb that had not yet been used, which means that it would have been made in the early 1st century AD, most likely in the AD 20s and certainly no later than AD 33. It was a tomb that had been cut out of rock, so it was cut into a rock face. It was not a natural cave that had been turned into a tomb. And it was in a garden that was next to Golgotha, whose name means place of the skull. And the evidence points to Golgotha being outside the city of Jerusalem. So that's the portrait that the four Gospels give us of the tomb and where it was located. Now we need to look at the theories concerning the tomb, including, and here comes this episode's twist, the theory that it didn't exist and that Jesus was never buried in a tomb at all. And before we get to that explosive twist, let's take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Eric D., Terrence G., Remedios S., Claire H., and Nathan K. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Jimmy, what theories are there about the tomb of Jesus? Well, first, as I mentioned, there is the theory that Jesus wasn't buried in a tomb at all, that the Gospels are simply inaccurate on this point. Second, there is a theory that Jesus' tomb is actually located in a place called Rosabal. Uh, This is located in the Kashmir Valley, which is basically where India, Pakistan, and Tibet intersect. A third theory is that Jesus' tomb is located even further east in a in Japan, in a location called Kirisuto no Haka. A fourth theory is that Jesus' tomb is located in a Jerusalem neighborhood named Talpiot. A fifth theory is that it's located elsewhere in Jerusalem at a site near what's called Gordon's Calvary. And finally, the sixth theory is that it's located in Jerusalem inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. 
So what can we say about the tomb of Christ from the faith perspective? The tomb of Christ is obviously of great spiritual significance to Christians. It would be a concrete reminder of what Jesus did for us, and it would be incredibly powerful to make a pilgrimage and visit it as a Christian. And In fact, I've done that twice, and it is extremely powerful. Having said that, it is not a matter of Christian dogma or doctrine that we know the exact site. We will see that there is a particular site that the evidence points to as being the actual tomb, and I personally believe that it is the actual tomb. But if it turned out that this view were mistaken, it would not disprove any article of the Christian faith. You know, Jesus still rose from the dead, regardless of exactly where he was buried. So the exact location of the tomb is not an article of faith, which is one reason that the Gospels aren't more specific about it. And so what follows in this episode will be from the reason perspective rather than the faith perspective. So what can we say about the tomb of Christ from the reason perspective? Which views do you want to consider first and why? Of the six views we named in the theories section, two of them are so out there that they are not taken seriously by anyone in the scholarly world. So we'll deal with them briefly and then focus in more depth on the theories that actually do have some scholarly support. These, as you can probably guess, are the ones that place Christ's tomb not just outside of Jerusalem, but far, far outside of it, either 2,300 miles away in the Kashmir Valley or 5,550 miles away in Japan. Nobody in the scholarly world takes those seriously. Is that because the gospel writers placed the crucifixion just outside Jerusalem at Golgotha, not thousands of miles away? No, that's actually not the reason. In both cases, the advocates of these views believe that the crucifixion did take place at Jerusalem, but they believe that Jesus didn't die at the crucifixion for reasons that we'll hear, and that Jesus later traveled eastward and died either in the Kashmir Valley or in Japan. Then let's talk about the theory that is geographically the most far out. What should we know about the view that Jesus is buried in Japan? Well, according to Wikipedia, Shingo Village in Japan contains a location of what is purported to be the last resting place of Jesus. The so-called Tomb of Jesus, or in Japanese, Kirisuto no Haka, and the residence of Jesus' last descendants, the family of Sajiro Sawaguchi. According to the Sawaguchi family's claims, Jesus Christ did not die on the cross at Golgotha, Instead, his brother, Isukiri, took his place on the cross, while Jesus fled across Siberia to Mutsu province in northern Japan. Once in Japan, he changed his name to Torai Tora Daitenku, became a rice farmer, or a garlic farmer in some accounts, married a 20-year-old Japanese woman named Miyoko, and raised three daughters near what is now Shingo. While in Japan, it is asserted that he traveled, learned, and eventually died at the age of 106. His body was exposed on a hilltop for four years. According to the customs of the time, Jesus' bones were collected, bundled, and buried in the mound purported to be the grave of Jesus Christ. This story is implausible on its face. Uh, first, we have no evidence that Jesus had any brother named Isukiri, or an Aramaic equivalent of that, whatever that would be. Um, second, the evidence that we have indicates that it was Jesus himself who was crucified, not a brother. Also, if Jesus had a brother who looked remarkably like him, then the twelve disciples would have known about the brother, and they would not have been fooled. Third, the story of Jesus migrating from Palestine to Japan is extremely improbable. There were no established trade routes between Palestine and Japan in this period, and it is extremely unlikely that a single traveler would make it there by himself. It's further improbable that a Palestinian Jew in the first century would have even known that Japan existed. So all of this is extremely improbable. But it gets even more improbable. The Daily Star reports, Each year, visitors flock to the so-called Tomb of Christ after the story of Jesus' apparent connection to Japan was discovered by local farmer Sajiro Sawaguchi in the 1930s. The farmer reportedly found the Takanuchi documents about Christ's unknown story in 1936 before they were destroyed in one of the Allied bombing campaigns during World War II. 
Thankfully, a transcription had been written down and kept safe. The farmer, Mr. Sawaguchi, did not just assert that he had found the Takanuchi documents, but he was also a descendant of Jesus himself. Today, the tomb of Christ stands on the top of a hill where crosses mark the so-called graves of Jesus and his brother, Isukiri. So this claim reportedly only dates to the 1930s, when it was made by the current owner of the farm, Mr. Sajiro Sawaguchi, who reportedly discovered it from reading family documents that conveniently no longer exist. So we can't examine the original documents for ourselves, meaning that we're dealing with an instance of Sherlock Holmes in the case of the missing evidence. Further, despite the migrations of people that would have occurred in the last 2,000 years, Mr. Sawaguchi is not only miraculously the owner of the current property, he claims he's also a direct descendant of Jesus, and his property not only holds the tomb of Christ, it also holds the tomb of his brother, Isukiri. This means that Jesus would have had to bring the body of his brother, or at least his brother's bones, with him to Japan, which was already improbable. Finally, neither tomb has been excavated and examined by archaeologists, so we have no way of telling what they contain, if they contain anything at all. All of this is highly suggestive of fraud or delusion. Either Mr. Sawaguchi cooked this up as a deliberate fraud, perhaps to make money off tourists, or it's the product of a delusion he's suffering from. In any event, given the fantastic nature of the claims, their extremely recent origin in historical terms, and the lack of any evidence to support them, we can dismiss this claim and it need not detain us further. Then let's talk about the next theory, that Christ's tomb is in the Kashmir Valley. What should we know here? Once again, Wikipedia provides a summary. The Rosabal, Rosabal or Rosabal, is a shrine located in the Kanyar Quarter in downtown area of Srinagar in Kashmir, India. The word Rosa means tomb. The word Bal means place. So together they would mean tomb place. Locals believe a sage is buried there. Yuz Asaf, alongside another Muslim holy man, Mir Saeed Nazaruddin. The shrine was relatively unknown until the founder of the Ahmadiyya movement, Mirza Hulam Ahmad, claimed in 1899 that it is actually the tomb of Jesus. This view is maintained by Ahasmadis today, though it is rejected by the local Sunni caretakers of the shrine, one of whom said, The theory that Jesus is buried anywhere on the face of the earth is blasphemous to Islam. So in Srinagar, India, there is a shrine called Rosabal, which means tomb place. The locals believe it contains the remain of two Muslim holy men. But in 1899, a man named Mirza Rulam Ahmad claimed it's the tomb of Jesus. Rulam Ahmad uh, was the founder of a religious sect known as the Ahmadiyya movement, which is an offshoot of Islam, but Orthodox Muslims consider it a heresy. Chief among its claims is that its founder, Hulam Ahmad, is an eschatological figure known as the Mahdi, or rightly guided one, and also a separate figure, the Messiah of the end times, and that Hulam Ahmad will bring about the peaceful triumph of Islam over the world. We won't go into Ahmadi belief beyond that, but instead we'll focus on their claims about the Rosabal Shrine. One of the key pieces of evidence that Hulam Ahmad cited was a verse from the 23rd surah or chapter of the Quran. In it, God speaks and says, And we made the son of Mary and his mother a sign, and we gave them refuge on a height, a place of flocks and water springs. So this verse says that God made Jesus and Mary a sign, that he gave them a refuge on a height, and that this height or high place had flocks and springs. But that could be basically anywhere, and most likely it would have been someplace in Israel, where there are lots of hills and mountains with flocks of sheep and springs. Nevertheless, Hulam Ahmad had a different view. Wikipedia summarizes, The founder of Ahmadiyya, Mirza Hulam Ahmad, inferring from verse 2350 of the Quran, believed that the only occasion in the life of Jesus, son of Mary, that his life was seriously threatened 
was when an attempt was made to kill him by the cross. The Quran saying that we prepared an abode for them in an elevated part of the earth, being a place of quiet and security and watered with running springs, Ahmad says, may very fittingly apply to the Valley of Kashmir. In his book, Jesus in India, he elaborately claimed that Rosa Bal was the tomb of Jesus. Ahmad had separately advocated the view that Jesus did not die by crucifixion, but traveled to the Indian subcontinent and died there at age 120. Swedish biblical scholar Per Beskow states that Khulam Ahmad separated Yuz Asaf into two components, Yuz and Asaf, and interpreted Yuz as Jesus and Asaf, the Hebrew for gather, as signifying Jesus the gatherer. This is not sound exegetical reasoning. Even if the Kashmir Valley has a high place that loosely fit the description of Jesus and Mary's refuge in the Quran, the much more likely interpretation is that the refuge would be somewhere in Israel where Muhammad knew Jesus lived. Also, very significantly, Hulam Ahmad claimed to be the Messiah expected in the end times by Muslims. Conventional Muslims believe that this Messiah will be Jesus, but Hulam Ahmad said no, it was him. Wikipedia's biography of him summarizes, Mirza Hulam Ahmad proclaimed he was the promised Messiah and Mahdi. He claimed to be the fulfillment of various prophecies found in world religions regarding the second coming of their founders. Mirza Hulam Ahmad's followers say that he never claimed to be the same physical Jesus who lived 19 centuries earlier. Mirza Hulam Ahmad claimed that Jesus died a natural death, in contradiction to the traditional Muslim view of Jesus' physical ascension to heaven and the traditional Christian belief of Jesus' crucifixion. He claimed in his books that there was a general decay of Islamic life and a dire need of a messiah. He argued that just as Jesus had appeared in the 14th century after Moses, the promised Messiah, i.e. the Mahdi, must also appear in the 14th century after Muhammad. According to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the promised Mahdi was a symbolic reference to a spiritual leader and not a military leader in the person of Jesus Christ, as is believed by many Muslims. With this proclamation, he also rejected the idea of armed jihad. So, good that he rejected the idea of armed jihad, but he's also making the grandiose claim to be the promised end-time messiah of Islam, which could be understood as a sign of delusion, especially since, you know, he's now dead. Furthermore, his claims about the Rosabal Shrine are extremely problematic. In the first place, the idea that Jesus didn't die on the cross is rejected by basically all unbiased scholars. I mean, it's common in Islam, but even skeptical agnostic scholars like Bart Ehrman consider it certain that Jesus was killed by the Romans by crucifixion. Further, we have no evidence at all that Jesus made a post-crucifixion journey to the Kashmir Valley in India. Some have made claims that Jesus visited India during his so-called hidden years, that is, between the time he was 12 years old and when he began his public ministry around the age of 30, and we'll discuss those claims in a future episode, though, spoilers, sweetie, they don't hold up to scrutiny. But that's a different period of Jesus' life than the post-crucifixion journey that Hulam Ahmad claimed, and we have zero evidence uh, for that claim. Also, concerning the Rosa Ball Shrine itself, Wikipedia states this. The shrine is first mentioned in The Story of Kashmir, published 1747, by the Khwaja Muhammad Azam Diramari, a local Srinagar Sufi writer. Muhammad Azam states that the tomb is of a foreign prophet and prince, Yuzasuf. The name may derive from the Urdu word Yuzasaf in the legend of Balkhar and Yuzasaf, Yuzasaf being a name for Gautama Buddha. So there is no mention of the shrine even existing until 1747, just 250 years before Hurlam Ahmad made his claim. That's far too long a gap, historically, from when Ahmad said Jesus died in the early 2nd century. Further, the actual evidence points to it being a shrine to Buddha 
not Jesus. So the Rosa Ball Shrine is simply not a credible site for the tomb of Jesus, and scholars do not take this claim seriously. Then let's look at some views that at least have some scholarly support. What about the idea that Jesus was not buried in a tomb at all? Who holds this and why do they think that? This is an extreme minority opinion among scholars. The man most famous for popularizing it was the Irish scholar and former priest, John Dominic Croissant. In his book, Jesus, A Revolutionary Biography, Croissant claimed that instead of being buried in a tomb, Jesus' body may have been eaten by wild dogs. This claim was widely rejected by scholars, including non-Christian ones, as ridiculous. And one of the scholars who rejected the idea was the agnostic Bart Ehrman. However, he later partially changed his mind. In his book, How Jesus Became God, Ehrman writes, John Dominic Crossan has made the rather infamous suggestion that Jesus' body was not raised from the dead, but was eaten by dogs. When I first heard this suggestion, I was no longer a Christian and so was not religiously outraged, but I did think it was excessive and sensationalist. But that was before I did any real research on the matter. My view now is that we do not know and cannot know what actually happened to Jesus' body. But it is absolutely true that as far as we can tell from all the surviving evidence, what normally happened to a criminal's body is that it was left to decompose and serve as food for scavenging animals. Crucifixion was meant to be a public disincentive to engage in politically subversive activities, and the disincentive did not end with the pain and death. It continued on in the ravages worked on the corpse afterward. So Ehrman's new position was that we can't know what happened to Jesus' body, but the normal fate of criminals' bodies was to be left to decompose and be scavenged, scavenged by animals. And he goes on to argue that this would be most likely what happened to Jesus, rather than him being buried in a tomb. What arguments does Ehrman propose for this view? He makes several arguments. Uh, first, as we just heard, that this was the normal fate of executed criminals in general. Second, that this normally applied particularly to people the Romans crucified. Third, that in the Greek and Roman worlds, executed criminals were normally placed in common graves rather than in tombs. And fourth, that Pontius Pilate was a uniquely cruel governor who would have been unlikely to grant Joseph of Arimathea's request for the body. Does Ehrman have evidence he can cite for his arguments? What do you make of them? He has evidence that he cites for each of his arguments, and when it comes to the first three arguments, he's correct. The character of Pontius Pilate is a separate issue that we'll deal with later, but Ehrman is right that the bodies of executed criminals were normally left to decompose and be scavenged, He's right that this normally applied to those the Romans crucified, and he's right that the bodies were normally placed in shallow common graves rather than tombs. But all of that is only what happened normally, or at least frequently. It doesn't show that this is what happened to Jesus, and this is something that is discussed by the New Testament scholar Craig Evans in his contribution to the response book, How God Became Jesus. We won't go through all of Evans's response to Ehrman, but it's really, really devastating. Basically, Evans points out no matter what happened frequently or even normally with executed and crucified criminals, the Romans did make exceptions, and that's something that Ehrman does acknowledge in his book. He acknowledges that Romans might, for example, turn the bodies of such criminals over to their families on special occasions, like a holiday such as the emperor's birthday. But Ehrman argues that this would not have happened in Jesus' case because Jesus was crucified at Passover, not the emperor's birthday, and because the Jews had no say in what happened to him after they handed him over. But this is just wrong. And to see why, we need to look at a verse in the Old Testament. Moses is giving legislation for what to do in various circumstances, and in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23, it says, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. 
So the idea is that if a man is executed by being hung on a tree, then he's cursed by God. And if you leave him up on that tree overnight, it will defile the land of Israel. And by implication, if you deliberately defile the land that God has given you, God may curse you. For example, with drought or famine or plague or by giving your enemies victory in battle. So you need to get the executed man off the tree the same day and bury him. We know that after the Jewish people encountered crucifixion, they interpreted a wooden cross as a tree for purposes of the law. For example, St. Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Now, the Jewish leaders were responsible for maintaining the ritual purity of the land of Israel. And so to do that, they would urgently demand that the Romans quickly give them the bodies of anybody who was crucified in order to prevent the land from being defiled and God bringing a curse upon the land because of this defilement. But Ehrman completely ignores this. He looks at what was commonplace Roman practice outside of Jewish Palestine and takes no account whatever of what Romans are known to have done inside Jewish Palestine. What Craig Evans does is mount a devastating case that the Romans did make exceptions when crucifying people in Israel, at least during peacetime. They may not have done this during the Jewish war from AD 66 to 73, but we know that before that, they did regularly turn over the bodies of crucified individuals in Israel so that they could be given a proper burial and avoid the curse. At one point, Evans quotes a summary of Roman law known as the Digesta or Digest, which says, The bodies of persons who have been punished should be given to whoever requests them for the purpose of burial. Digesta 48, 24, 3. He then writes, This summation of Roman law makes it clear that bodies were sometimes released to families and friends. Indeed, the Digesta argues that the bodies of the executed, quote, should be given to whoever requests them for the purpose of burial, end quote. Emphasis added. In light of what we read here and in light of what we find in other sources, it is simply erroneous to assert that the Romans did not permit the burial of the executed, including the crucified. Bodies were, in fact, released to those who requested them. The Jewish historian Josephus himself makes this request of Titus, son of Vespasian, and Titus granted it. Life of Josephus, 420-21. Evans continues, The Romans, Josephus says, do not require their subjects to violate their national laws. Against Apion, 273. The Jewish historian and apologist adds that the Roman procurators who succeeded Agrippa I by abstaining from all interference with the customs of the country kept the nation at peace. Jewish War 2.220 Customs that included never leaving a corpse unburied against Apion 2.211 Had Roman governors in Israel, especially in the vicinity of Jerusalem itself, regularly crucified Jews and left their bodies hanging on crosses, It is unlikely they would have kept the nation at peace. Evans also discusses this specifically in connection with crucifixion. Had Pilate and other Roman governors of Israel in the 6th to 66 CE period of time regularly crucified people, whether Jewish or Gentile, and left their bodies hanging on the cross unburied, thus defiling the land, there would have been riots, if not uprisings. Josephus applies this point specifically to crucifixion when he says, in reference to the rebels who had seized control of Jerusalem in 66 CE and killed some of the hated ruling priests, they actually went so far in their impiety as to cast out their dead bodies without burial, although the Jews are so careful about burial rites that even malefactors who have been sentenced to crucifixion are taken down and buried before sunset. Jewish War 4.3.17 Those sentenced to crucifixion in the time of Josephus were people crucified by the Romans and not by Jewish rulers such as the Hasmoneans. And although crucified by the Romans, these unfortunates were taken down and buried before sunset. 
So we have evidence of Romans allowing Jews to take down the bodies of crucifixion victims and bury them so that the land would not be defiled in keeping with Deuteronomy 21. The responsibility to get an executed man off of the cross would fall particularly to the Jewish ruling council or Sanhedrin, and it would especially apply to the Sanhedrin if they were the ones responsible for the execution. This sheds light on why Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the council, asked for Jesus' body. Craig Evans writes, According to Jewish law, it was the responsibility of the council to bury the executed. At least in Jerusalem, the traditions elsewhere in Israel may have been different. It is against this legal and cultural backdrop that the story of Joseph of Arimathea should be understood. Because the Jewish council, or Sanhedrin, delivered Jesus to the Roman authorities for execution, it was incumbent upon it to arrange for proper burial, as in Mishnah Sanhedrin 6.5 cited above. This task fell to Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the council. The gospel narratives are completely in step with Jewish practice, which Roman authorities during peacetime respected. Joseph was actually the perfect person to make this request, since he was both a member of the council and a secret Christian. As a member of the council, he would have legal standing to make the request of Pilate, and other members of the council wouldn't view him with suspicion, since he was one of their own number and could thus volunteer for the assignment that would have fallen to someone from the Sanhedrin. And as a secret follower of Jesus, he would be motivated to volunteer to provide Jesus with a decent burial. So, the four gospel accounts of Joseph of Arimathea asking for the body actually make a ton of sense. What about Ehrman's re- argument that Pontius Pilate was too cruel a ruler to grant Joseph's request? Pontius Pilate has a reputation for cruelty in many circles today, but whether he was actually cruel and how cruel he was is debated among scholars. Normally, Roman governors were appointed to a post for just a single year, but Pilate remained governor of Judea for 10 years, and that could suggest that he was actually pretty competent as a ruler. No doubt he did some things that would have offended Jewish sensibilities from time to time, but the Gospels actually show him complying with the request of the Jewish ruling council, So we have evidence that he could also cooperate with the Jews. He wasn't all mean all the time. In his book, Bart cites two incidents from Josephus, the Jewish historian, to show what a cruel ruler Pilate was. One involves an instance where Pilate took money from the Jewish temple treasury to finance the building of an aqueduct. And when Jewish people protested against this act, he had his soldiers infiltrate a crowd and then attack the people with clubs, killing some of them. And, well, that was cruel. But the other incident that Ehrman relates actually undermines his case that Pilate would never yield to Jewish sensibilities. Evans explains, One of the incidents involving Pilate that Ehrman mentions supports the point I am making. I refer to the incident in which Pilate attempted to place Roman standards bearing images of the emperor in Jerusalem. Josephus explains that Jewish law forbids the making of images, and that for this reason, previous Roman governors never attempted to bring such images into the holy city. What would have made these images especially offensive in Jewish eyes is that the Roman emperor was considered divine, a son of God. Such images then would constitute a clear violation of the command not to make images of God or of other deities. That the previous Roman governors never attempted to bring images into the city shows that Roman authority did indeed respect Jewish law and custom in Israel, and often outside Israel as well. Pilate either did not understand Jewish law and custom and so acted in ignorance, or he did, thinking he could force on his Jewish subjects his allegiance to the emperor. In either case, he quickly learned how loyal the Jews were to their law and wisely backed down. This incident occurred early in Pilate's tenure as governor, and so it was an early lesson for him that sometimes you need to yield to Jewish sensibilities, and that's exactly what we see him doing in the Gospels when it comes to the death of Christ. So, contrary to Ehrman portraying Pilate as a completely inflexible ruler who would not grant Jewish requests, we see that he did. 
Also, the fact that he kept the peace in Judea for 10 years suggests that he was following the usual custom of letting crucified men be taken down and buried in keeping with Deuteronomy 21 and authors like Josephus and Philo. What's more, we actually have archaeological evidence that Pilate granted such requests. Evans writes, We actually possess archaeological evidence from the time of Jesus that confirms the claims we find in Philo, Josephus, the New Testament, and early rabbinic literature to the effect that executed persons, including victims of crucifixion, were probably buried. The discovery in 1968 of an ossuary of a Jewish man named Yohanan, who had obviously been crucified, provides archaeological evidence and insight into how Jesus himself may have been crucified. The ossuary and its contents date to the late 20s CE, that is, during the administration of Pilate, the very Roman governor who condemned Jesus to the cross. The remains of an iron spike, 11 and a half centimeters in length, are plainly seen still encrusted in the right heel bone, or calcaneum. Those who took down the body of Johannin apparently were unable to remove the spike, with the result that a piece of wood from an oak tree remained affixed to the spike. Later, the skeletal remains of the body, spike, fragment of wood in all, were placed in the ossuary. So here we have direct archaeological evidence of a man who was crucified in the late A.D. 20s, about the time that Jesus and John the Baptist were beginning their ministries during the tenure of Pontius Pilate. And yet, Pilate did let this man's body be taken down and given a customary Jewish burial, which is something that Ehrman just ignores. So in light of Evans's devastating critique— Herman's theory that Jesus may not have been buried in a tomb is looking really bad. And in light of that, Croissant's proposal that his body was eaten by wild dogs is even more ridiculous. So it's no surprise that this is a fringe theory that is not broadly supported among biblical scholars, even skeptical ones. Then let's look at the theories that have at least some scholarly support. Each of these holds that Jesus was buried in a tomb and that this tomb was in Jerusalem. The fourth of the six theories we're looking at holds that Jesus' tomb is located in a Jerusalem neighborhood named Talpiot. What can you tell us about this one? This theory began to be popularized about the year 2007, when the film director, James Cameron, known for Aliens, Terminator 2, Titanic, and Avatar, and a journalist named Simka Jakobovici, released a documentary on the Discovery Channel called The Lost Tomb of Jesus. There also was a parallel book called The Jesus Family Tomb that was written by Jacobo Vici and an American author named Charles Pellegrino, who has repeatedly and falsely claimed to have earned a Ph.D., so that's not a good sign. On his blog, Arche Bible Archaeology Report, Brian Wendell writes, Located about five kilometers, or three miles, south of the old city of Jerusalem is the Talpiot Family Tomb. It was originally discovered in 1980, but rose to fame with the 2007 Discovery Channel documentary, The Lost Tomb of Jesus, which was produced by James Cameron and directed by Simka Jakovopici. Ten ossuaries were discovered within the Tapiot tomb, bearing names such as Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. The filmmakers identified one of the ossuaries bearing the inscription Maria Mane as belonging to Mary Magdalene, suggesting she was married to Jesus. Only two of the ossuaries contain a patronym, helpful identification, Jude, son of Jesus, and Jesus, son of Joseph. This has led some to conclude Jesus of Nazareth and Mary Magdalene had a son named Judah. Supporters of the Talpiot tomb also point to DNA testing, which demonstrated that Jesus and Maria Mene were not maternally related. In the Discovery Channel documentary, the filmmakers used this as evidence to suggest they were married. Scholar James Tabor contends that the famous James Brother of Jesus ossuary came from the Talpiot tomb, suggesting it was the family tomb of Jesus of Nazareth. So that's a basic summary of the case for the Talpiot tomb being connected with Jesus. How much support has the Talpiot tomb hypothesis gained in the scholarly community? Basically, none. 
It, it is supported by James Tabor, and he is a scholar, but he's a highly eccentric one. Uh, Tabor is known for championing colorful views that basically nobody else believes, and he's the only actual scholar I know that supports the Telpiote tomb hypothesis. What do you make of the arguments the Telpiote tombs re- supporters propose? What about the fact that one of the ossuaries had the inscription, Jesus, son of Joseph? Well, in the first place, it's not at all certain that this is what the inscription even says. It does not clearly say Jesus, son of Joseph. Instead, some scholars have read the first name not as Yehoshua or Jesus, but as Hanun. And the second name isn't actually Yehoseph or Joseph, but a shortened name, Yoseph. So it may be Hanun, son of Yoseph, not Jesus, son of Joseph. But let's suppose it does say Jesus, son of Joseph. What would that actually prove? As Brian Wendell states, Scholars have pointed out that the presence of names such as Jesus, Joseph, and Mary is not as compelling an argument as the filmmakers made it out to be. Simply put, they were among the most popular Hebrew names in the first century A.D. Cameron and Jakovobici have read more into these names than is warranted. Now, the Talpiot supporters have tried to make statistical arguments to shore up their claim, but as Mark Twain said, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, and statistics. But we don't need to make this complicated. In his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the British scholar Richard Baucom did a statistical study of the names that were known to be in use in first century Jewish Palestine. And these were among the most common names at the time. For example, the name Joseph was the second most common name for men after Simon. There are 218 known occurrences of it out of 2,625 male name occurrences that we have records of, you know, either literary or archaeological inscriptions. That means that 8.3% of all men were named Joseph. And putting that another way, one in 12 men were Joseph's. Similarly, Jesus was the sixth most common male name with 99 occurrences out of 2,625. So 3.8% of men were named Jesus, and one in 27 men were Jesus's. That means purely by random chance, one in 12 men would be named Joseph, and of those, one in 27 of the Josephs would have a son named Jesus. That means one in 320 families would have a Jesus son of Joseph in them. Now, in his book, Jerusalem in the Time of Jesus, the scholar Joachim Jeremias estimates that the population of ancient Jerusalem was about 55,000. If we cut that in half for half the population being female, then there would be about 27,500 males in Jerusalem. And so we would expect 86 of those men to be named Jesus, son of Joseph. So 86. Jesus, son of Joseph's, in Jerusalem alone. But we can put an even finer point on this, because we wouldn't even be talking about the Talpiot tomb unless it had an ossuary with the name Jesus on it. I mean, if it had ossuaries with names like Dosithius and Ptolemaeus and Zechariah, no one would, we wouldn't even be talking about this as Jesus's family tomb. So, given that the ossuary is of someone named Jesus, rather than Hanun, what are the odds that his father would be named Joseph? We've already seen the answer to that. One in twelve. Put another way, for every tomb in Jerusalem where we find an ossuary with the name Jesus on it, the odds that that Jesus' father was named Joseph were one in twelve. And we would expect 86 such Jesus son of Joseph's to be found in Jerusalem in every single generation around the first century. So these odds are far from astronomical. There should be dozens of Jesus, son of Joseph's, in Jerusalem at any one time, and the Talpiot ossuary's inscription thus proves nothing about it belonging to Jesus of Nazareth, even if 
we read it as saying Jesus, son of Joseph, rather than Hanun, son of Yosef. What about the argument that, according to their DNA, the Jesus and Maria Mene in the tomb did not have the same mother? So Maria Mene may have been Jesus' wife. Well, it's possible that this Maria Mene was the wife of this Jesus, but that's not remotely indicated by the evidence we have. Just because a man and a woman don't have the same mother doesn't mean that they're husband and wife. Uh, one problem here is that we don't even know that the people in the in this tomb were a family. It's possible that this was a family tomb, but we don't know that. It's a guess. And so if this wasn't a family tomb, then this Mary Amene may have had no relationship at all to this Jesus. She's just someone buried there. Perhaps she lived in the same neighborhood, but was otherwise unrelated. And even if they are related somehow, an even bigger problem is that we don't know what generations this Jesus and this Mary Amene belong to. It could be that they belong to different generations, and Jesus is the father or grandfather of Mary Amene. And even if Jesus and Mary Amene belong to the same generation, that doesn't mean that they're husband and wife. It could also mean that they're cousins or that they had the same father but different mothers, making them half-siblings. And there are other possibilities yet, so this is a terribly weak argument. What about James Tabor's proposal that the James, the brother of Jesus ossuary, originally came from this tomb, and that this would put Jesus of Nazareth's brother, a member of our Jesus' family, in the same tomb? The so-called James the Just or James the Brother of Jesus Ossuary was first made the news in 2002, and it has an inscription on it that says, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. It was touted as the burial box of James the Just, the so-called brother of the Lord. Uh, we may have an episode on it in the future, so I won't go into detail here. However, the authenticity of the inscription on the box is widely disputed, with some arguing that the box's owner, a man named Oded Golan, forged it, or at least forged part of it. More fundamentally, the James ossuary was just not found in the Talpiot tomb, and there are strong reasons to hold that it was not originally in the Talpiot tomb. Brian Wendell summarizes, A chemical fingerprint is said to have been found on both, with similar trace amounts of phosphorus, chrome, and nickel, components in the clay of East Jerusalem soil. As impressive as this sounds, however, a very small sample size was used, calling into question the results. Moreover, the James ossuary may have come from another tomb in East Jerusalem. The tests do not prove it came from the Talpiot tomb. Also, the physical appearance of the James ossuary, with its pitted and worn surface, is unlike the smooth limestone surfaces of the ossuaries from the Talpiot tomb. Archaeologist Shimon Gibson, who was one of the original excavators of the Talpiot tomb, has stated, I don't think the James ossuary has anything to do with Talpiot. So, with the appearances of the James ossuary being different and more worn than those in the Talpiot tomb, it suggests that the James ossuary was stored in a different environment with more weathering for a very long period of time. Wendell and others have also pointed this out. The supporters of the Talpiot family tomb have failed to adequately explain the most obvious flaw in their theory. Since Jesus' family was from Galilee, why would they have a family tomb in Jerusalem? Archaeologist Jody Magnus has pointed out that at the time of Jesus, only wealthy families buried their families in rock-cut tombs and used the secondary burial practice of later interring the bones in ossuaries. A poor family from Galilee would have used an ordinary grave. Furthermore, Magnus asserts that the names on the ossuaries from the Talpiot tomb indicates that the tomb belonged to a family from Judea, where people were known by their first name and father's name, whereas Galileans would have used their first name and hometown. So it's very unlikely that Jesus' poor Galilean family would have had an upper-class tomb in Jerusalem. And if they had, they would have written Jesus of Nazareth on an ossuary located in Jerusalem, not Jesus, son of Joseph. Now, I've elsewhere argued that as a family that contained migrant workers, since Joseph was from Bethlehem but lived in Nazareth, 
that the family likely would have owned property in both locations, in Bethlehem and Nazareth, in keeping with the practices of migrant workers all over the world, uh, who tend to have one home where their family is from and another home where they work. Well, Bethlehem is near Jerusalem, but the family was still poor and would not have a fancy upper-class tomb, and whatever family tomb they may have had in southern Judea would have been in Bethlehem, not Jerusalem. So this dog doesn't hunt. I thus conclude with the vast majority of scholars that the Talpiot tomb claim is simply not credible. A fifth theory we're looking at holds that Jesus' tomb is located elsewhere in Jerusalem at a site near what's called Gordon's Calvary. What can you tell us about this view? It's actually quite popular as a view among evangelical Protestants, and many evangelical pilgrims to Jerusalem regard this location as Jesus' authentic tomb. But the view is not supported by the scholarly community for reasons we'll see. This tomb is located in a garden, so it's often called the Garden Tomb. It's also called Gordon's Tomb because the idea that this tomb was where Jesus was buried was popularized in 1883 by the British Major General Charles Gordon. And for the 19th century, he was the very model of a modern Major General. Though in military matters he was plucky and adventurous, his career was not the most distinguished of the century, and he ended up getting bogged down in a siege in Khartoum, Sudan, by Muslim Mahdists who killed him and cut off his head. However, in matters of vegetable, animal, and biblical, he was the very model of a modern major general. In fact, he was quite interested in biblical matters and spent a good bit of time in Jerusalem though he wasn't the first to start exploring this general part of Jerusalem as a site for Christ's tomb. YouTuber Religion for Breakfast explains, Another contender for the tomb of Christ emerged, a location that became known as the Garden Tomb. Located outside the medieval walls, north of Damascus Gate, the story of this tomb begins in the 18th and 19th centuries, as Protestant Christians began to doubt the authenticity of the Holy Sepulchre. But the story really takes off with the American scholar Edward Robinson, who visited Ottoman-era Jerusalem in 1838. In his personal quest for physical evidence of the Bible, he vowed to ignore all ecclesiastical traditions, even those that were most sacred, such as the location of the tomb of Christ. In the publication of his travel accounts, he claims that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre could not be the location of the tomb, based on his assumption that it fell inside the walls of Jerusalem during the life of Jesus. Some accepted this idea, but it also drew fiery backlash, even from fellow Protestants. Nevertheless, Robinson's book was read across the world, and his ideas caught on. The groundwork for an alternative location for the tomb of Christ had been laid. Fast forward to 1883 when one of England's most famous generals traveled to Jerusalem, Charles Gordon, a renowned leader in the British Empire. Like other Europeans in the 19th century, he had long wanted to explore the Holy Land, and one of the major ideas he floated was a new location for the site of Golgotha. While sitting on the roof of his building, Gordon would often meditate while looking north toward a rock face with an interesting shape. According to him, it looked like a skull. If the term Golgotha referred to a physical hill that looked like a skull, Gordon believed he had found the location where Jesus had been crucified. Now, several others before him had already proposed this idea, but it quickly became attached to Gordon. He was later killed in battle, and the fame of this British war hero lent serious credibility to the idea, mainly among Western Protestants. The Skull Hill quickly became known as Gordon's Calvary. If the location of the crucifixion had been found, the search for the tomb was on. There are several tomb complexes nearby Gordon's Skull Hill, including the site now known as the Garden Tomb just a few meters away. This tomb was excavated in 1867 and was accepted as the Protestant location for the Tomb of Christ. The property was purchased in 1894, and the Garden Tomb Association was soon established. To this day, the site remains open to the public in East Jerusalem, and Protestant Easter services are even held in front of the tomb to this day. So that's a basic sketch of the argument for the Garden Tomb. It was reasoned that the traditional Church of the Holy Sepulchre could not be the Tomb of Christ since it's inside the walls of Jerusalem. So people started looking outside those walls for another site. Charles Gordon and others found a hill just north of the city that looked kind of sort of like a skull. Uh, There's also a supporting argument that Gordon proposed for his site being Calvary 
that Religion for Breakfast doesn't mention. In his book, Archaeology in the New Testament, scholar John McRae explains, Insight into the method used by General Gordon to identify the tomb as Jesus' burial place is obtained from a letter Gordon published in 1885 in the quarterly statement of the Palestine Exploration Fund. He wrote that when he visited the Skull Hill, he felt convinced that it must be the place of Christ's crucifixion since it was north of the city. Jesus, he reasoned, would have been slain north of the altar, as were the Old Testament sacrificial lambs, of which he was the type. He also determined that the lay of the land supported its analogy. He saw various land formations of Jerusalem as representing a skeleton. Skull Hill, Golgotha, or Calvary, and the garden tomb represented the head. The land lying between Skull Hill and the Temple Mount was the torso, or sides and the Temple Mount was the pelvis. Had not Psalm 48.2 spoken of Zion on the sides of the north? Emphasis added, the legs in Gordon's theory of symbolic geography extended south to the Pool of Siloam. Based on the appearance of the hill and its location at the top of Gordon's geographical skeleton, they assumed it was Golgotha and thus the site of the crucifixion, and they then went looking in this vicinity for the sites of tombs, and they found several, one of which they identified as the tomb of Christ. A supporting argument that Religion for Breakfast doesn't mention is that the tomb they identified has a groove or trench cut in the rock face outside it, and it was proposed that this trench was what was used to roll the stone in front of the opening to the tomb itself. We thus need to ask ourselves, So is this a contender for the authentic tomb of Jesus? No, not at all. In 1986, the archaeologist Gabriel Barquet conducted a study of the garden tomb. He concluded, based on the shape of the tomb, that it had been carved out not during the time of Jesus, but in the Iron Age, hundreds of years earlier during the Kingdom of Judah. The tomb lacks the burial niches common to the Second Temple period, and instead contains the remnants of burial benches that were used in the Iron Age. Moreover, there are other Iron Age tomb complexes nearby the Garden Tomb, and by contrast, tombs from the Roman period are not known in the area. Barquet's study dealt a serious blow to the idea that the Garden Tomb could be the tomb of Christ, and no scholar to my knowledge views it as a plausible candidate. Moreover, it's unlikely this hill looked the same 2,000 years ago anyway. Erosion is a thing, especially for those of you that have experienced Jerusalem's winters. There are thus multiple problems with the garden tomb. Uh, first, the traditional site was excluded because it's within the present walls of Jerusalem. But as we'll see, that was not the case in the first century. Second, it was selected based on the fact that it currently kind of sort of looks like a skull, but it likely only looks that way because of weathering and erosion in the last 2,000 years, and it probably didn't look like that in the first century. Third, the site for Golgotha was selected based on Gordon's belief that it needed to be north of the Temple Mount in order to fulfill an Old Testament typology about where the lambs were slaughtered. But as we're about to see, the traditional site all is also north of the Temple Mount, so it doesn't it it doesn't favor Gordon's site in that way. Fourth, it was based on Gordon's overlaying of Jerusalem with an imaginary skeleton, with Gordon's Calvary as the skull of the skeleton and the Temple Mount bizarrely as its butt, and this is just Gordon being fanciful. Concerning the last two points, in Archaeology in the New Testament, McRae explains, Obviously, Gordon relied heavily on a personal biblical typology, a typology manufactured more from emotion than from sound archaeological or biblical interpretation. In his letter, Gordon admitted that, unless the types are wrong, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre should never have been taken as the site. As a matter of fact, the Holy Sepulchre is situated north of where Jerusalem's northern wall stood in the days of Jesus, a fact unknown to Gordon. That wall was built no earlier than the time of King Agrippa. He made a similar error when he assumed that the Romans entered Jerusalem through the modern Damascus Gate. Thus, Gordon's vision of a skeleton superimposed on the city of Jerusalem with its head at the garden tomb 
is now just one more interesting, if not amusing, piece of the mountain of folklore which has grown around the Holy City. So the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was outside the walls of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. The wall that Gordon thought included it in the city wasn't built until later in the first century, during the reign of King Herod Agrippa around AD 40. Fifth, on the basis of Gordon's super shaky identification of Golgotha, They then went searching for a nearby tomb, but there are multiple nearby tombs, making the selection of one particular tomb problematic. Sixth, the tomb they did select dates from the wrong period of history. The 20th century archaeological investigations revealed that it was not built in the style of a first century Jewish tomb, that there are no first century Jewish tombs nearby, and that this tomb was actually made hundreds of years before Christ in the 7th or 8th century BC. That means it has to be six to 700 years before Christ, and so it was not, as John says, a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. And seventh, that groove or trench in front of the tomb, it wasn't there in the first century, and it wouldn't be there for another thousand years. And it wasn't used for rolling a stone in front of the tomb. Instead, it was cut during the 11th century AD by the Crusaders, who used it as a watering trough for donkeys and mules. As a result, Religion for Breakfast can say, Barquet's study dealt a serious blow to the idea that the garden tomb could be the tomb of Christ, and no scholar to my knowledge views it as a plausible candidate. So the garden tomb, or Gordon's tomb, is not at all a good candidate. Then let's turn to the sixth and final theory of where Christ's tomb is located, that it's in Jerusalem, inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. What should we know about this view? Once again, Religion for Breakfast provides a good backgrounder. The traditional site of the execution, burial, and resurrection of Jesus are all housed within one building, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Well, at least according to most Christians, including the Catholic Church, the Armenian Apostolic Church, and the Greek, Coptic, Syriac, and Ethiopian Orthodox Churches, all of whom share some degree of ownership of the site. Located in the northwest corner of the old city of Jerusalem, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was originally commissioned by the Roman Emperor Constantine and dedicated in 335 CE. However, much of the building you see today is a medieval construction. Over the course of its history, it was damaged again and again, either from fire, earthquake, or invading armies. If you want to see evidence of the original church, you can see some remnants in the adjacent building called the Alexander Hospice, and the area around the rotunda, which preserves most of its remains still standing. But even so, the dome has been rebuilt repeatedly, and none of the original interior decoration from that era survives. Today, its bluish-gray domes stand out on the skyline of the old city. Inside the church, you can wind through the dark, cavernous halls, visit the purported site of the crucifixion, watch pilgrims touch the so-called Stone of the Unction, where the body of Jesus is said to have been anointed for burial, and of course visit the traditional site of the tomb itself, which stands in the main rotunda of the church inside a shrine called the Edicule. The majority of Christians throughout history have accepted the authenticity of this location, and thousands of pilgrims visit the church each day. But what does archaeology tell us about the building and its surrounding area? Is this a plausibly authentic site for the tomb of Jesus? The answer to that question will depend on why this site was chosen. The original version of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built at the order of the Emperor Constantine, who also arranged for the funding and materials for the project. And it was built at the site indicated by the local bishop of Jerusalem, who was a man named Makarios, which means happy in Greek, so he was Bishop Happy. Now, before we go further, we should clear away one idea that you commonly hear. You may have heard that the Emperor Constantine's mother, Helena, chose the spot instead. This is a claim repeated online all the time, including on Wikipedia, but it's probably not true. Our earliest source about the construction of the church is Eusebius, who only mentions Constantine and Macarius being involved. Now, Eusebius does mention Helena elsewhere in the text, but he only gives her credit for sponsoring two churches, one in Bethlehem commemorating where Jesus was supposedly born, and one on 
the Mount of Olives, where Jesus is said to have ascended to heaven. Eusebius lavishes her with praise, so had she been involved with excavating the tomb of Christ, we would expect him to mention her as well. But her involvement is mentioned decades later by other Christian writers. For example, the Christian historian Socrates Scholasticus, writing almost a century after Eusebius, explicitly says that Helena, the emperor's mother, being divinely directed by dreams, went to Jerusalem. She sought carefully the sepulcher of Christ, and after much difficulty, by God's help, she discovered it. But as far as we can tell, the church was already being built by the time Helena arrived in Jerusalem around 327 CE. So the evidence that Helena had anything to do with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre isn't good. Uh, Socrates Scholasticus knew that she had gone to Jerusalem, and she did. But writing a century later, it appears that he assumed she searched for the site of Christ's burial, Yet the Church of the Holy Sepulchre seems to have already been under construction by the time she arrived. So let's turn our attention to our earliest source on this topic, the church historian Eusebius of Caesarea. He lived at the same time as the Emperor Constantine, and he knew the emperor. And being the bishop of Caesarea Maritima, he was right there in Israel. So he was in an excellent position to be informed about all this. In his third book of his Life of Constantine, Eusebius writes, After these things, the pious emperor addressed himself to another work truly worthy of record in the province of Palestine. What then was this work? He judged it incumbent on him to render the blessed locality of our Savior's resurrection an object of attraction and veneration to all. He issued immediate injunctions, therefore, for the erection in that spot of a house of prayer, and this he did not on the mere natural impulse of his own mind, but being moved in spirit by the Savior himself. So Constantine directed Bishop Makarios of Jerusalem to have a suitable church built at the site of Jesus' resurrection. To understand why it was built where it was, we need to understand something about the history of Jerusalem. After the time of Christ, the Jewish people in Palestine began a war against the Romans that lasted from AD 66 to 73. And in the middle of the war, in AD 70, the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple and most of the city of Jerusalem, just as Jesus had predicted. But around 130 so A.D. 130, during the time of the emperor Hadrian, the Romans decided to rebuild Jerusalem as a Roman colony. They gave it the name Aelia Capitolina. They built a temple to Jupiter on the Jewish Temple Mount, desecrating it, and they built a temple to Venus, or Aphrodite, over the site of the crucifixion. Eusebius continues, For it had been in time past the endeavor of impious men or rather let me say of the whole race of evil spirits through their means, to consign to the darkness of oblivion that divine monument of immortality to which the radiant angel had descended from heaven and rolled away the stone for those who still had stony hearts, and who had supposed that the living ones still lay among the dead, and had declared glad tidings to the women also, and removed their stony-hearted unbelief by the conviction that he whom they sought was alive. This sacred cave, then, certain impious and godless persons had thought to remove entirely from the eyes of men, supposing in their folly that they thus should be able effectually to obscure the truth. Accordingly, they brought a quantity of earth from a distance with much labor and covered the entire spot. Then, having raised this to a mark 24, they paved it with stone, concealing the holy cave beneath this massive mound. Then, as though their purpose had been effectually accomplished, they prepared on this foundation a truly dreadful sepulcher of souls, by building a gloomy shrine of lifeless idols to the impure spirit whom they called Venus, and offering detestable oblations therein on profane and accursed altars. For they supposed that their object could not otherwise be fully attained than by thus burying the sacred cave beneath these foul pollutions. And now, acting as he did under the guidance of the Divine Spirit, Constantine could not consent to see the sacred spot of which we have spoken, thus buried, through the devices of the adversaries, under every kind of impurity, and abandoned to forgetfulness and neglect. Nor would he yield to the malice of those who had contracted his guilt, 
but calling on the divine aid, gave orders that the place should be thoroughly purified. Thinking that the parts which had been most polluted by the enemy ought to receive special tokens through his means of the greatness of the divine favor. As soon then as his commands were issued, these engines of deceit were cast down from their proud eminence to the very ground, and the dwelling places of error, with the statues and the evil spirits which they represented, were overthrown and utterly destroyed. So Constantine ordered that the Temple of Venus be torn down. He further ordered that they dig up the ground underneath it since it had been polluted by idol worship. Eusebius continues, Nor did the emperor's zeal stop here, but he gave further orders that the materials of what was thus destroyed, both stone and timber, should be removed and thrown as far from the spot as possible, and this command also was speedily executed. The emperor, however, was not satisfied with having proceeded thus far. Once more, fired with holy ardor, he directed that the ground itself should be dug up to a considerable depth, and the soil which had been polluted by the foul impurities of demon worship transported to a far distant place. This also was accomplished without delay. But as soon as the original surface of the ground beneath the covering of earth appeared, immediately, and contrary to all expectation, the venerable and hallowed monument of our Savior's resurrection was discovered. Then indeed did this most holy cave present a faithful similitude of his return to life, in that after lying buried in darkness, it again emerged to light, and afforded to all who came to witness the sight a clear and visible proof of the wonders of which that spot had once been the scene, a testimony to the resurrection of the Savior clearer than any voice could give. So, after demolishing the Temple of Venus, they found the tomb of Christ underneath it. But why? And they weren't expecting to. But why would Bishop Macarius identify the Temple of Venus or Aphrodite as the place of Christ's burial? One proposal is that this was precisely because the Temple of Venus, also known as Aphrodite, marked the spot. Eusebius says that the men who built the temple there first covered over the tomb of Christ so that it would be forgotten, and it could have been that this was their conscious intention to cause people to lose track of the site, or that could be Eusebius's inference of what their intention was. But by covering the tomb and then building a temple on top of it, they effectively marked the spot. And that's all the local Christian community needed to remember. Christ was buried under the temple of Aphrodite. So this could be an early example of the Streisand effect. By trying to cause something to be forgotten, you actually call attention to it and cause it to be remembered. Back to Religion for Breakfast. As early as the late first century, Christian tradition had already established that Jesus was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem, and scholars generally agree that any crucifixion would have taken place outside of the walls of Jerusalem anyway, based on what we know about Roman execution practices. Moreover, most Roman-era burials were also outside the city walls. In fact, according to Jody Magnus, Jerusalem was basically surrounded by a necropolis of rock-cut tombs during the lifetime of Jesus. So if it was common sense that any crucifixion and burial would have occurred outside of Jerusalem, and there's even a scriptural tradition to back that claim up, the current location of the church might seem to contradict this. The church is squarely within the big, impressive walls of the old city. But these walls are much more recent, constructed under the Ottomans during the 16th century. During the first century, this area was almost certainly outside of the walls of Jerusalem. We know this because of the writings of the Jewish historian Josephus, who seems to have an accurate knowledge of Jerusalem's layout, as well as from the findings of archaeological excavations. Now, today the area around the Holy Sepulchre is not the most conducive place to conduct archaeology. It's a densely built up area, and if you visit it, the church entrance seems to emerge suddenly after winding your way through narrow pathways. But some small excavations nearby have shown that the area was the site of a rocky ancient quarry. These excavations also suggest that the area was undeveloped during the time of Jesus, lacking any buildings that date to the first century. Moreover, the church appears to be built over several of those tombs that I mentioned before, the tombs that surround Jerusalem. 
Six burial niches from the late Second Temple period are preserved in a small Syrian Orthodox chapel next to the rotunda. Visitors can enter the chamber and view the niches today, though I apologize for the super dark footage. This is the best I could get blindly sticking my camera inside, but you can see the niches here on screen. Because of their proximity, some scholars argue that these visible burial niches and the alleged tomb of Christ isolated inside the Edicule may have originally been part of the same burial complex that was severed by Constantine's workmen when the original church was built. So based on the historical and archaeological evidence, the space around the Holy Sepulchre did indeed sit outside of the walls of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. What's interesting though is that this location was inside the walls during Constantine's excavation. In the early 2nd century, the Emperor Hadrian rebuilt and resettled Jerusalem, giving it a new Latin name, Aelia Capitolina. The Romans proceeded to radically transform the layout of the city. This included expanding the city to incorporate the area that would one day be the site of the church, and also constructing a new temple of Aphrodite, the same temple that Eusebius says was demolished in the quest for the tomb of Jesus. This means that Constantine and the Bishop Macarius decided to dig at a location inside the city of their present day, contrary to the tradition that Jesus' tomb was located outside of the city. Some have argued that the decision to dig at this location inside the walls does not make any sense unless they were acting on a pre-existing local tradition. A tradition perhaps stretching back to the second century or earlier that had long since identified this site under the Temple of Aphrodite as the location of the Tomb of Jesus. According to this theory, the local Christian community couldn't act on the tradition and uncover the tomb until Constantine had legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire. And that seems to have been exactly what happened. In addition to what Eusebius says about Constantine and Makarios going straight to this site, we have other clues that also point to there being a pre-existent local tradition that this is where the tomb of Christ was. Religion for Breakfast goes into what some of those clues are, but the decisive action of Constantine and Makarios is very strong evidence that to this tradition in and of itself. So, that of itself gives us good evidence that there was such a tradition. In fact, so are Eusebius's statements on this, because he was a bishop in Judea himself. Uh, his see, you know, where he was bishop of, was Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima, which is just 55 miles north of Jerusalem as the crow flies. So Eusebius himself likely knew the tradition before Constantine even legalized Christianity. As a local bishop, he would have been to Jerusalem a bunch, and oh yeah, Christ was buried right, right under that temple. Furthermore, Eusebius also preserves a letter that Constantine wrote Makarios about the tomb. In it, Constantine says, I have no greater care than how I may best adorn with a splendid structure that sacred spot, which under divine direction I have disencumbered as it were of the heavy weight of foul idol worship, a spot which has been accounted holy from the beginning in God's judgment, but which now appears holier still since it has brought to light a clear assurance of our Savior's passion. The language Constantine uses doesn't prove this, but his discussion of how the site has been holy from the beginning in God's judgment is consistent with the idea that there was a pre-existing Christian tradition about this site, and it has been counted holy from the beginning among followers of God, that is, Christians. To summarize, the area was an undeveloped quarry outside the walls of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus, which coheres with what's described in the Gospels. The area had at least a few tombs, and Constantine's decision to dig there was seemingly not random, but rather was guided by a pre-existing local tradition. Because of these lines of evidence, Jody Magnus says, many scholars think that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre likely is the authentic spot where Jesus was crucified and buried because the tradition is so ancient. But you still have that 300-year gap, which is a leap of faith that archaeology cannot cross. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the tomb of Christ? Contrary to claims like of individuals like John Dominic Croissant and Bart Ehrman, the evidence is actually very good that Jesus was buried in a tomb. Contrary to the claims of some, that tomb was not in either Japan or the Kashmir Valley in India. Instead, the tomb was in the Jerusalem vicinity. 
Contrary to the theory that was floated in 2007, the Talpiot tomb was not that of Jesus or his family. The mere appearance of the name Jesus, son of Joseph, on ossuaries does not prove that. Uh, There would have been dozens of such individuals in Jerusalem alone, if that's what the inscription even says. And Jesus' family was from Bethlehem and Nazareth and was poor, so they would not have had an upper-class tomb in Jerusalem. Contrary to a view that was popularized in 1883, the garden tomb or Gordon's tomb is not that of Jesus. The garden tomb dates from six to 700 years before the time of Christ, so it was not a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Instead, the evidence points to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as the most likely site of Jesus's tomb. It was outside the walls of Jerusalem in the first century when Jesus was crucified. It was in an undeveloped quarry, the kind of place that Romans would use to perform crucifixions. It was connected with other tombs that were in the area. And whether the Romans did it deliberately or accidentally, they marked the spot of Jesus's burial by building a temple to Venus over it, allowing Christians to remember exactly where to dig once Christianity was legalized. The evidence thus points to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as the archaeologically most likely site of Jesus's tomb, and that's exactly what I think it is from the reason perspective. And what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers on this topic? We'll have a link to the response book, uh, How God Became Jesus, by Craig Evans and others. They're responding to Bart Ehrman's book, How Jesus Became God, so we'll also have a link to that, buyer beware. Uh, We'll have a link to Joachim Jeremias' book, Jerusalem in the Time of Jesus, Richard Baucom's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, which is gobsmackingly outstanding, Uh, John McRae's book, Archaeology in the New Testament. We'll also have Religion for Breakfast's video, Where is the Tomb of Jesus? Uh, Links to Eusebius's Life of Constantine, book three, which we quoted from. Also, information from Wikipedia about the Tomb of Japan, uh, Shingo Japan, a Daily Star article on the Japanese tomb, information about Rosa Ball, uh, information about Mirza Hulam Ahmad, information about uh, Yehohanan and his crucifixion, information about the Talpiot tomb, archaeo- uh, Bible archaeology reports, uh, discussion of on three of the tombs, Michael Heiser's article, Thinking Clearly About the Jesus Family Tomb, information about the James Ossuary and Cyrus Gordon, and the Modern Major General song, which I was riffing on a little bit earlier. It's from the Pirates of Penzance, and yes, I can sing the entire song, but I won't at the moment. We'll also have a video of the song. Excellent. So that's it from us. What are your theories about the tomb of Jesus? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515, 738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they do for the show. Uh, they're available for hire, so they can help you out with your video and animation and other design needs. You can check out what they do by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, and watching one of the Mysterious World videos. And I hope you'll do that. While you're there, uh, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, because if you do those things... It tells Wikipedia, or it tells YouTube's algorithm that uh, you found this video engaging, and thus other people are likely to find it engaging, so YouTube will show, show it to more people, and you can help promote the channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing. And, you know, I am trying to grow my channel, so I really appreciate it if you subscribe, and be sure to hit the bell notification so that you always get notifications whenever I have a new video. Usually there's a few a week now, uh, whether it's a Mysterious World video or one of the other videos I do. Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? 
Next week is the week that leads into Christmas, so we'll be doing a special episode in which Cy Kellett and I discuss the mystery of the very first Christmas. What do we know about it, and how do we know? Very good. So, folks, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World T-shirt or mug or more. Uh, makes a great Christmas gift <laughs> or Epiphany gift, uh, so you can get it in time. And more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 289. And incidentally, you can also find all of the links for the various feedback forms uh, on the same show pages. So you can check it out there. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by... Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. And by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. And by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Howdy, folks. This is Jimmy Aiken with a special message as we approach the Christmas season. Five years ago, StarQuest launched Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, which has become one of the most popular Catholic podcasts. The show educates and entertains tens of thousands of people every month, exploring mysteries and showing how we can use critical thinking to evaluate extraordinary claims. We're very proud of how Mysterious World has grown and fulfills our gospel mission. But we're not done yet. We are reaching tens of thousands, but even more people could benefit from hearing this and all the shows at StarQuest in our unique apostolate of spreading the gospel with podcasts and videos. To keep growing, to fulfill that mission, we need your help. In the course of the nearly 300 episodes of Mysterious World, we've continually improved the show, adding a video version and animations that help illustrate the concepts we discuss. We've also begun adding video to our other shows, as well as to enhance their presentations and reach new audiences. We've also launched new shows, most recently The Secrets of Sacred Art, which is best enjoyed as a video. And we have plans for even more growth, bringing the light of Christ to even more people online. We need your help, though, to make that happen. We have many generous supporters, but as time goes on, some people inevitably have to step back from giving. As a result, our resources have started to decrease. That's why it's very important that we hear from you this Advent and Christmas, the time of year when nonprofits receive most of their support for the year. If you're already a supporter of StarQuest, we thank you and ask you to prayerfully consider increasing your support at this time. If you're not yet a financial supporter, please become one now. Every gift counts. Could you give $15 or even just $10 a month? Whatever level of support you can offer, please show your support for SQPN this Christmas and remember that your gifts may be tax deductible. Just go to sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. May God bless you this Advent and may you have a blessed Christmas season.